Welcome to Skype Radio. My uh, guest tonight, uh, John Tomasi from the United States. He's a political philosopher at Brown University in Rhode Island. Um, he's the author of a book called Free Market Fairness, published in 2012, in which he uh, urges and argues for a classical liberal reappropriation of the idea of social justice. Uh, this could be summed up, could it not, by a kind of attempted marriage between John Rawls and Friedrich Hayek, in a way. Um, he is the founder and director of the Political Theory Project at Brown University, um, a research center dedicated to the study of ideas and institutions that might make societies more free, prosperous, and fair. So with him today, I want to explore the ideas of market liberalism and how that squares in with the idea of social justice, or if it can. So, uh, John, you... It's okay if I call you John? Of course not. Um, um, social justice uh, is usually associated with left-wing uh, pursuits, um, certainly not with libertarianism. Yes. Um, so what on earth can you mean by the classical liberal version of social justice? So I think um, originally people in the classical liberal or liberal tradition talked about the benefits of, benefits of markets in a way that always made the concern for the poor very central. So we think about Adam Smith. Adam Smith describes a prosperous society, he defines a prosperous society not so much in terms of the amount of gold that it heaps up, heaps up in the place, but rather a society is prosperous, Smith says, if insofar as any person who exerts a little labor can make a decent life for themselves. And Smith says prosperity of the nation is the prosperity of all the people. And that idea, and Smith of course is famous for talking about the poor as not a separate genus as just people, regular people. Um, and that idea that classical liberals always talked about the poor and kept the poor central, I think got lost along the way. When people started talking about social justice, they used it to talk about a certain way of caring for the poor, mainly through state apparatuses. And so I think that people on the free market side, I think unfortunately, turned their back on social, social justice a little bit too early. And I'm trying to encourage my free market friends to rethink that rejection of social justice and perhaps to recombine Rawls and Hayek. Um, so, in, in your in your um, estimation, um, the uh, tradition that is called social liberal, which includes people like Rawls and Keynes and John Stuart Mill and others, um, kind of forgot something essential about the uh, classical liberal, liberal tradition. Um, yes, and, and, and that something would be. Um, a high regard for property rights and 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 and, and free market ideals. Uh, that's would, right. Would that be that be a fair fair summary? So that, that, that's so, right. So so I think uh, and yeah. I think I think, that, I think philosophically that I the dichotomy that I was taught in graduate school in the early '90s and that people like you may be being taught still maybe being taught still is that there's a strong dichotomy between the free market people and the social just social justice people. And interestingly, that's, that's really not the case. And I, I have this kind of interesting letter that I haven't told you about, but I thought I'd show you or tell you about. It's a letter that someone showed me, a friend, Pete Betke. And it's written by, from Frederick Hayek to James Buchanan, another great uh, defender of the free market. And the letter's written in 1965. And um, so here's Frederick Hayek. He signs it. It's a handwritten note. And it's, uh, he signs it Fritz. And he, Hayek says that, um, he's writing to, 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 um, to Buchanan, and he says, you, know, you and I are worrying about the same set of ideals, ideas, the, the, the question of what are the rules of conduct which are appropriate for a free society. And then Hayek says, kind of surprisingly, incidentally, quote, the only modern philosopher from whom I received some help from this is John Rawls of MIT. And Rawls at the time was a first-year assistant professor at MIT. And Buchanan's reply a week or two later, he says, I agree on the work of John Rawls. Um, I agree that he's doing the most interesting work in philosophy, and I hope that he has some impact. And of course, Rawls <laughs> did, have, did have some impact. And, and it's sort of interesting that in, in, 60, in, the, in the 1960s, at least, Hayek and Rawls were actively talking with each other. And um, Hayek, and, Hayek and, and especially um, Buchanan and Rawls became quite close. And there was, a, there was kind, of a, kind of a moment of convergence, I think, a decade or so of convergence, when Rawls' early work was talking about this really important question that's a foundation for social justice, 
that's often not not, not appreciated. And Rawls's foundation is this: justice is a property of institutions, not particular distributions. So the paper of the early article by Rawls, which became a foundation for all Rawls's work, an article that came out in the journal called Nomos, Rawls makes that argument. He says justice is a property of institutions. How do we judge institutions? Well, we look at their long run effects in terms of the, the distributions too. But justice is not a property of particular distributions. That means that Smith's idea of a free market society benefiting all people could perhaps satisfy a standard of social justice. So it's really interesting and really important, I think, to recognize that Rawls and Hayek and Buchanan, at least in the 60s, were seeing themselves as allies working on a common project. And then that project got divided and two camps split off. And that's what we, some of us, grew up, grew up with. And I'm trying to look back and ask, what did they agree about? Can we re remember what that might have been and then build something new on that foundation? That's, that's my basic idea. Um, and, and the people themselves, like Rawls and, and Keynes and Mill, kind of saw themselves as working within the liberal tradition broadly defined, didn't they? I mean, they were not necessarily arguing for socialism or, or, or even social democracy as it is currently understood, although their ideas uh, you know, were, were taken in that direction. And perhaps l later in life, people like Mill were more and more inclined to take it in that direction. But uh, Yes, so was Rawls. Yeah, and Rawls yeah. and life became increasingly attracted to the socialist possibilities. But that's right. The people, there, there, there's a broad liberal tradition that takes liberty very seriously. But the key moment, I think, or one of the key moments that did lead, that did lead to this divide within liberalism between left liberals and classical liberals, I think it begins with, with Mill and Mill's skepticism that economic liberties, liberties of working, those sort of libertarian ideas of uh, saving your money for yourself, getting a job, supporting oneself. Mill seemed to think that those kinds of economic liberties were not real, those economic acti activities were not essentially connected to liberty. And so Mill suggested that that cluster of liberties, those economic liberties, that have been so important to people like, like um, Adam Smith, um, that they be set aside and diminished. And Keynes continued that, Rawls continued it too, and we ended, we ended up with an interpretation of social justice that does not make much space for economic liberty. And my idea is to try to reimagine social justice when we give adequate respect to economic liberty. And you're arguing for what you call a thick conception of economic liberty. That's um, right. So that, that probably means that uh, there is kind of value in itself, or at least very strong instrumental value. Um, I don't know if your if your position is more in the rights camp or in the in the consequentialist camp here, but w w would you say that uh, economic liberty is good in and of itself, even if it doesn't lead to always good outcomes, or is it good because it leads to good outcomes? I think it can be good in both ways. So I sort of, I sort of think of it as working the model working on two levels. First, I think we think about agency, and on, on the agentic level, we try to pick out certain protections that people need if they're going to be able to, to live their lives for themselves. And so um, Rawls talks about moral powers. I talk about moral powers, too. It's more of a rights-based approach than a consequentialist one. And I think there's, a, there's a, a thicker conception of economic liberty, thicker than what Rawls, for example, recognizes, that should be recognized within his framework. But then after we figure out what basic liberties we have, the agentic ones, then we ask systemically which the, which the, what political systems are most likely to satisfy the condition that we do the best for the poor over time. And I think, on balance, that market institutions tend to have a much better record of that than more socialistic ones. That's that's what I want to ask you about because you you will uh, put great emphasis on the kind of Hayekian Hayekian interpretation of the of the liberal tradition, uh, yes. in, in which patterns of distribution and this is a quote from your book, uh, paraphrasing Hayekian ideas, patterns of distribution within the social world are not a reflection of anyone's intention or design, but emerge as the unplanned and ever-changing product of choices individuals make in pursuit right. of their goals and yes. ends. And you also see this uh, operating within the Lockean and Smithian uh, philosophy uh, uh, as well. So um, so this is putting great emphasis on the, on the market uh, outcomes. Uh, however, uh, you also emphasize the role of institutions, and of course the markets yes. themselves are a kind of institution in some sense. But, yes, certainly. But, uh, certainly. But, but there's also the idea of uh, using state institutions. So I want to ask you about, you, you think that people like Mill and Keynes and Rawls perhaps took that uh, too far, but 
I'm sure you see some role in uh, in, in state institutions. Uh, yes. See people like uh, Smith and Hayek um, uh, had what you call a lot of open-minded attitude towards certain functions of the state. Uh, so, you know, starting with Smith's idea that uh, education should be uh, granted in one way or another, uh, preferably using market forces, but if, if not possible, then using some uh, state mechanisms uh, to to poor people and and so on. So yes. so where do you where do you where where do you draw the line? Where do you where do you cross from liberalism to to you know socialism or uh, yes. some, some other horrible thing? So I I think of, I think of there being sort of two dangers um, that we have to try to sail between. On one side is a danger I see it as a danger at least of a kind of very strict libertarianism, um, say a la Murray Rothbard, in which property rights become absolutes. So if someone earns something, that, that stuff is 100% that person's and no moral, not, not, if any, any taxation at all is theft. On the other side, the other, other, the other danger, I think, is giving way too little weight to economic liberty, in which economic liberties are just something that will be decided entirely by legislators, entirely by democratic processes, and I think that what market democracy tries to do is try to find that middle space. And what I do, I, the way I find that space is saying that there's a set of economic liberties that I call thick economic liberties, liberties of working and liberties of ownership, including private ownership of productive property, that people have liberty rights to. So they're among the basic rights and liberties, along with free speech, along with freedom of religion. In that cluster of basic rights and liberties are some, very, are some strong economic liberties. They're not the weightiest. They don't outweigh everything else. We can make trade-offs within the basic set to maintain the whole scheme of basic liberties. But that way, it's not obviously the case that any taxation is theft. Yet the, give, yet people can show, that they try to show in my schema, is their agency threatened by tax rates at a certain level? And if someone, if someone wants to say, a very wealthy person say, that a 5% tax rate is impinging on my agency, I think it's difficult to make a public reasons argument for that kind of claim. But what if tax rates are 40% or 50%? then perhaps they can start making that kind of an argument. So my model allows a little more flexibility than we get on either of the other sides because it puts economic liberties front and center, but within a whole scheme of liberties. So that's, that's, that's the basic idea. And once you have that possibility now of uh, giving principle to arguments for economic liberties that are not absolutist, now there's some, some play space in which taxation can be legitimate, in which we can justify uh, social safety nets, we can justify, say, it's voucher programs for schooling or perhaps direct support for public schools if those prove to be, prove to be effective. So my system allows for some flexibility that other two systems can't quite accommodate, I don't think. Um, so you're very critical of the kind of Nautic and Rothbardian version of libertarianism, or at least you see that it's going too far. Um, but well, the, I, I should say I am. I, I, I sort of grew up that. <laughs> I grew up with, in that tradition. And I'm still very uh, attracted to it in many ways. I'm teaching a course this semester, a sophomore seminar on bleeding heart libertarianism. And we started off by reading some classics, Rand, uh, Rothbard, uh, Milton Friedman. And anyway, among those authors, I was just so struck again by how many of the students in the class were just completely attracted by the Rothbardian, you know, the, the radical nature of his view. So it's true that I don't talk about it much in the book and it's not the system I work in anymore. But I'd like to at least note that there's something really exciting happening in Rothbard's work, even if it's not always as sophisticated philosophically as it might be. Yeah, I agree, and also it's not my view, but it's and, and, and also also with Nozick. I mean, Nozick is a very yeah. is a brilliant philosopher. Let's, of, let's course. Say, you know. of course, uh, but but perhaps people like Rand would be very hard to kind of uh, re uh, Randians are are sometimes very hard to reason with in, in these areas, perhaps. But, if, I, uh, if I can just, I think that's right. If I can just say about the Nozick, yeah. I think something really, really important historically also is that. Because Nozick was so prominent, Nozickian, Nozick's defense of the free society kind of became the gold standard, of it, especially within philosophy departments. So the question was usually be asked, do you choose between Rawls or Nozick? And that's how I was, that's the question that was raised to me when I went to graduate school in philosophy. And I think that's an unfortunate distortion. I think Hayek and the Hayekian tradition got dropped out of the conversation. Because there were, Hayek was kind of a semi a quasi consequentialist, and a lot of the people who were doing free market work, like Milton Friedman, was a straightforward consequentialist, as I read him. And so people felt that when Rawls knocks out consequentialism to do this new, more deontologically based theory, that he knocked out all those classical liberal views too. 
So the only rival left was this kind of very hard Nozickian libertarianism. And I'm trying to resurrect classical liberalism and make it respectable again philosophically in the hopes that we can invigorate our conversations about public reason. Um, explain a little bit of the uh, bleeding hard libertarian term that you use there. Is that sure. a straight up follow up to kind of classical liberalism or is it something a bit different? You know, I think people are still trying to figure it out. When it began, <laughs> my friend Matt Zolinski, who I'm writing a book with now, Matt and I, Matt, Matt um, took the term, I think, from Danny, Danny Shapiro, a mutual friend, a free market philosopher. And um, the original meaning, I think, uh, five years ago, was a bleeding heart libertarian was a person who affirmed economic, two, he affirmed two things, economic liberty and social justice. So that was the unique kind of combination that would make someone a bleeding heart libertarian. And um, on, that, on that definition, my book, Free Market Fairness, is probably the first full-length treatment of a defense of bleeding heart libertarianism. I prefer classical liberalism to the term libertarianism, but the term I tried to use was neoclassical liberalism, which is an ugly phrase, and the term bleeding heart libertarianism seems to have taken off because it's more attractive and it lends itself to better logos like bleeding hearts and so on. But that's, that's the basic idea of, of bleeding heart libertarianism. You combine a strong concern, concern for property rights and economic liberty with a basic commitment to social justice. It means more than that now, and it's expanding in ways that I'm working on too, but that's, that, that was the beginning definition at least. And in reinvigorating this kind of uh, mess, me, what you call the messier tradition of classical liberalism and, yes. and bring it forward into the new millennium perhaps, uh, uh, we're kind of, we, we are, I'm, I'm positing myself in that same tradition, uh, yes. are, are in a way fighting the kind of space of, 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 of reasons for, for kind of with the, with the social democratic uh, forces, which are also very strong, of course. Um, yes. Um, so, but but in your book, you you say some really good things about Thatcher and Reagan, and uh, I, I don't I, <laughs> I, I don't see that as as being a good uh, selling point to convert people from social <laughs> social democratic <laughs> backgrounds. But uh, true. But true. hey, uh, um, so the, of course there's a wide range of views within you know libertarianism and liberalism and all these things and and the whole social liberal movement whatever that even means it's, there's so many so many things going on in academia and so on but can I, can I make a quick point about Margaret Thatcher sure if you don't mind sure so you you you, <laughs> you mentioned her and as you you may know when she first came to power she took one of Hayek's books the Constitution of Liberty put it on the table and pounded it, said this is what we believe really strikingly on her final question time when she's when she's at the end of her career she's leaving Parliament she gives this wonderful talk. You might want to look it up on, on YouTube. If you Google Thatcher, uh, so Thatcher's last ride or Thatcher's last stand against socialism, she does this amazing thing. She talks, does this argument about uh, to her critics about what she's accomplished, what she tried, what she's tried to do to, as a as prime minister, and without knowing it, she gives this Rawlsian argument. And it's this straight up Rawls. She says, "My opposition on the Labour Party, they want to have everyone equal, and they're fine to make people." Uh, more equal if, if they make them all more poor. But she says instead, I think we should try to get make everyone richer, including the least well off, even if they're more unequal. So he says, she says of her opponents, they'd rather the poor be poorer so long as the rich be less rich. That's this side. And she says, by contrast, she describes herself as an advocate of property owning democracy. And she says, I advocate inequality so long as it works for the benefit of the least well off. So without even knowing it, I think. Thatcher begins her political career by pounding on a Hayek book, and she closing it, closes it by giving Rawls the formulation of the difference principle. And what's more, I sort of snuck in a term you, you may have noticed, uh, Thatcher describes herself as advocating property-owning democracy. And property-owning democracy is one of the main uh, philosophical terms that the, the Rawlsians use to talk about a very a social democratic ideal. So what we also see is that there is this tradition that philosophers still have not paid much attention to of property owning democracy that gives very heavy weight to economic liberty. And you know, Thatcher was the, the daughter of a shop keep, shopkeeper. She had the idea, she saw the virtues of hard work, of independence, of really being able to stand on your, stand on your own two feet. These are challenges in our economy, I understand, but that ideal that people should have a chance and should be respected because they try, because they work, because they stand on their, on their own two feet. That ideal is very attractive, and again, it shows the blurring between left and right that we start being able to do once we start thinking in market democratic terms, the terms that I try to encourage. 
and if people actually took the term property owning democracy seriously and and combined that with thick economic liberty and limited government i think that would be a, a pretty good program forward um and, and and it's something that people um on the moderate left can also probably um move towards if, if, if i think that's right but, but I, should, I say that on the Rawlsian versions of property owning democracy, they're very left liberal, very big, very big government involved in intergenerational transfers and lots of state-based programs. So I'm interested, interested in the idea from Thatcher, as it happens, that maybe there's another tradition of property owning democracy that again makes markets very central. So it'd be a rival version, like I'm preventing a rival version of social justice. There's probably also a rival version of property only democracy but, that could be developed. Uh, let's look at a country like Sweden, uh, just to look at it yeah. from another angle. I mean, there's a country, there's, there's a country that's, uh, that's a, has a long history of being the home of social democracy and so on. And, and, in, and, in, Finland, yes. and in Finland, our, our, our model is very much kind of modeled after the Swedish model and, and so yes. on. Um, yes. But, but the Swedes have now been moving kind of more and more towards some version of, of perhaps a market, market friendlier uh, version of social democracy. and. And, and, it, yes. and it seems that uh, there are different uh, different ways of uh, kind of uh, coalescing towards uh, uh, similar outcomes. Um, I mean, uh, yes. certainly it's it's no utopia of building our libertarianism yet, but uh, yes. Which, so I've been following Sweden very closely, and I'm I'm just fascinated by it. one of one of the first. Uh, I, spent, I spent a week in Sweden shortly after my book came out. And I was really surprised to see the interest that people in Sweden had in this sort of American social justice kind of, of argument. And um, there's a, one of my one of my few political heroes, or at least few politicians who I think a lot of, um, is their, fi their, their former finance minister, Anders Borg. And Anders Borg, um, you may know know of his work, but Anders Borg, um, he has this policy that he calls work first. And the idea is that you want to make work more comfortable than welfare. But he does that in a way that's not, if a, if, a, if a Republican politician in the United States said that, he or she would be just killed for saying something so hard-hearted. But Borg says that against the background of a, Democrat, of a sure Democratic commitment of solidarity, of real community, of a commitment not to leave, that no one should be left behind who wants to work. And yet he also says that we want to create a society in which we're judged not by the, our compassion is judged not by how many people are on social welfare. Rather, our compassion is, is judged by how well we do in providing everyone the chance to make something of their own lives. And the society has an obligation, I think, and I think this is what Borg thinks too, many of the Swedes think, to provide real chances for people to make something of themselves on their own terms. That means providing them with economic liberties. It also means providing a social safety net, as the Swedes uh, famously do. But I think it's really interesting that in Sweden, what we had, especially under the moderate, the moderate government, moderate party government, was people speaking openly in market, what I call market democratic terms, but very much in the background of, of a democratic commitment to social justice. And I think that's a really encouraging and hopeful bit of dialogue, that, or discourse, that happened there. And it uh, gives me a lot of hope for market democracy. And one, one source of hope for me personally is the... Uh capacity of people from both the left and the right to come together, for example, to fight for welfare reforms. For example, in Finland, yes. Finland I've been working uh, with the basic income uh, movement, which tries to, yes. which tries to uh, bring together the old, very bureaucratic uh, social welfare system and transform that into a, a kind of a very, very simple and, and, and market friendly uh, welfare system, something on the lines of basic income or negative income tax. Uh, and, That's right. and in that movement, there, there, are, there are ways of bringing to, uh, together people from the left and the right. And as you know, that, that, the idea of a, of a basic income has long been part of the classical liberal tradition. Absolutely. It's something that yes. Milton Friedman, for example, very, very much thought very highly of. But again, to notice that we're talking about these kinds of programs of marketizing, and, that, and the, the existing moral models from philosophy tend to think, they, they insist, in fact, that morality all blows toward the left, that the, the winds of morality and normativity are strongly blowing toward left institutions. And places like Sweden, when they started moving away from those left institutions in the 70s and the 80s, they did that because they did that because they're being forced to. They're looking at, down the barrel of an economic gun. My idea is that in fact, whether even if they were forced to move for economic reasons, in fact, maybe morally speaking, they're doing something right too. So that morality, the highest ideals of social justice, I think, do not the winds do not all blow towards the left. 
in many ways, they blow towards the right, if the right means private economic liberty. So the challenge in my book is to, it's a moral challenge. I'm trying to suggest that not only is market democracy an alternative to the old social democratic ideals, but it's actually a morally superior competitor. And if you hold the, both those views up together, one which denies the importance of economic liberty, one which recognizes the importance of economic liberty, that other view, the market democratic view, is morally superior. It's a better account of social justice. So that's kind of, that's my, that's my long range hope that we can see not just as a viable operational way to get, get through a financial crisis, but rather come to recognize that advocating markets is something we should do in a settled, long-term way. That if we really care about the least well-off among us, we should give people freedom. We should design our welfare programs if we have them to maximize our freedom that people have to make choices for themselves, to be responsible individuals, not just to be people who are being taken care of. So that's you know, part of the idea as well. Um, a cynic might uh, take issue with, with the book uh, and the project in saying that, uh, oh, it's just actually kind of using left-wing rhetoric to advance uh, right-wing ideals, and it's, yes. it's deceptive, and it's not really taking social justice seriously. What do you say to that? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think uh, early on when I was first working on the project, that's what people were saying to me. But I think that's... Um, I mean, I, I think that's not that's not right. It's really I'm, I'm genuinely trying to ask if we start with the democratic idea of trying to find the social terms we can all agree upon that show the respect we have for one another. What should those terms be? And I resist the idea and reject the idea that people working a generation before us had all the right answers, and we have to either accept what they say or just stop thinking. I think that's an ongoing process. I think it's an ongoing question. How do we decide? how we live together in ways that best respect each other. And as a moral matter, I still have not yet, I've yet to hear, I've given many, many talks on free market fairness to many different audiences. I've yet to hear a strong argument that makes me think that I'm wrong to think that we do respect each other better when we respect, respect our economic liberties. Not only economic liberties, not just property rights come hell or high water, but to add economic liberties and take them more seriously than people on the left have seems to be a, to be a moral improvement. So. It's not, it's not just words, it's not a trick to get right-wing things in. It's a sincere attempt to understand what does this democracy require. And it does not require, I think, making people into passive recipients. It requires we try to give everyone the chance to lead a good life of their own. And at this point, I might uh, advertise, I was just at a conference of the European, uh, European students of, uh, of liberty and... Uh, oh, excellent. <laughs> uh, it seems to be... Can you see it's the wrong way around or something? But it's peace, love, and liberty. No, I can see it. Okay, it's peace, <laughs> peace love, and liberty. And um, so there's a book. There's a book called Peace, Love, and Liberty that I'm reading right now by them. Yeah, right. Um, it's, it's really nice. It's really it's nice. A, it's a beautiful, and, and, it's a beautiful and, book. And uh, I, I found lots of interesting ideas in the Pleading Heart Libertarian uh, camp being discussed and thrown around there. So uh, it's, yes. it's good to see that, and also in the academic world. So. Have you, what's been the reception to your book, and uh, what is the state of the of the research program right now? So it's um it's been it's it's it sold a lot of copies. So we so we were running out of running out of print runs on a on a regular basis for the first year or so, and it's it's been very gratifying. One thing that I'm just signing off on now is that there's a Chinese a Chinese language translation is coming out, uh, I think next year. Um, a big thing that just happened is I just finished a, there's been a symposium in a journal called Critical Review. And in response to some critics, I'm making some significant changes in the, in the model and just trying to make it grow and keep it moving. There's also a symposium in a European journal called Race Publica that I'll be working on uh, in the next few months. So there, there have been now four journal symposia um, on the book. And every time, it's, it's a great chance for me to meet really smart critics, many of whom are very skeptical or are very eager to try to defend the, the inherited ideology as I think of it. And I'm trying to move them. And uh, it's, it's been very exciting. And uh, the group you mentioned, the Students for Liberty, you know, they're kind of like a popular arm, it seems to me, of the Bleeding Heart Libertarian movement. And part of their success and growth, I think it shows that these ideals of caring for people, genuinely caring for people, caring about racial issues, caring about environmental issues, caring about peace, those issues can be tied with people who care about economic freedom. And it's not, there's no one has a moral monopoly on, 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 the, on the right thinking. And I think the Bleeding Heart Libertarians are doing a very healthy, uh, tr tr transgressing borders and, tr and crossing up the dialogue in a really healthy way. So I'm really happy to hear that you've had some dealings with them. Absolutely. Um, and it would be 
a great pleasure to, to discuss in detail all the economic, uh, environmental and, and all these very difficult topics. But um, I, I book, I'm, writing a book, I'm writing a book now. Matt, I mentioned Matt Swolinski. Matt Swolinski is a philosopher in California who's the founder of Bleeding Heart. He's the founding and the editor of Bleeding Heart Libertarians, a blog. And he and I are writing a book for Princeton, A Brief History of Libertarianism. And we're doing it in a topic-based way. So we pick one topic per chapter. And among the topics we take on are topics like race and gender and environmentalism and poverty, um, and a whole range of issues like that. And we try to, so we're trying to broaden the bleeding heart, uh, broaden the fronts of bleeding heart libertarianism. So it's not just economic liberty and social justice, but also asking, well, what can libertarians say about racial injustice, historical injustices, or, or gender, inequ gender inequality? And we're trying to find new ways to address those by looking back into history and defining again that when you look into the historical sources, you find many rich suggestions for different ways of caring about the poor, caring about racial injustice, caring about the environment. And we're hoping to bring some of that back to the conversation as well, Matt and I are. Do you have uh, any graduate students or anything working on some master plan to take over the world? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I have um, there's a graduate student named Nick Geezer who just came to Brown from Yale who's uh, very interested in these kinds of topics. What he'll do, I don't know, in terms of his dissertation. But there are a lot of students who I'm in touch with, many through the group called the Institute for Humane Studies that I've mentioned to you before, who are interested in this broad, this broad project. And there's also a group in China who are thinking about this and working on these things. They're trying to ask, in that concept, they're trying to ask, well, if we have all this growth coming from markets, or from, from quasi-markets at least, what does that mean about the kind of society we are or, or might be? If we become a market society, does that mean we have to become an unjust society? And what does it mean to re recognize rights at all, I suppose, is a broader question that they're asking. But it's encouraging me that people, to me, that I gave, a, I, gave I was at a conference in India in um, February, and people there are thinking about this now, too. They're asking, well, can we, if we marketize in the, in the developing world, what does it mean to advocate markets? Is it just a temporary thing we do to get some economic juice in the system? Or are there moral things at play now, too? When we start recognizing people's economic rights, do they start unleashing a dimension of freedom that people will come to, to really care about and will be willing to stand up for and fight for if they need to? And I think it's healthy to see that markets are not only a, a device that we reluctantly adopt in the developing world, but a device that we have moral reasons to adopt, that we respect our citizens, our fellow citizens, when we respect their economic liberties. So that's happening. That's in China. That's in India. And uh, it's, I'm happy and really honored to be some small part of those conversations. Well, I think it's just uh, fantastic and fascinating, and uh, and uh, it's not only good for 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 the uh, for the left to have been more market friendly ideas, but it's also perhaps good for for the right to to get back to these uh, very important yes. topics that are shaping the the future of, of our societies. So, Thank so, you. I agree. Both both sides should grow. I think no. growth is the most important thing, and it's, it's, it's this is a sincere attempt to grow. Absolutely. Um, so um, I guess I will just uh, thank John Tomasi as, uh, as uh, we've had a good conversation here. Um, how will people be able to find out more about you? Of course, they'll find the book uh, probably online and, and so on. Um, any other venues for finding out about these things? If they go to my website, um, they'll find a, a whole list of um, interviews and lectures and discussions about the various aspects of the project. And I, I'm always trying to learn new things and trying to grow. And if people do go there and, read, and hear some things that I say and have ideas, I'd, have, I'd be happy to hear them. So I'm easily emailed. Well, thank you very much. Free Market Fairness is the name of the book. Uh, John Tomasi has been my guest. And uh, Bleeding Heart Libertarianism has, uh, has a long way to go, but I'm sure it has also long legs and it's going to carry us further into the future. So thank you very much. Thanks, Otto. It's been a pleasure.